This is David Osteen, pastor of Hope Bible Church in Locust Grove, Georgia, and I want to deal with a question concerning the Trinity. Is it a Bible doctrine? Now, we understand the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the doctrine that the word signifies certainly is in the Bible, and I, for one, don't have a big problem with using the word Trinity. I like the word. Uh, you see in the word Trinity, tri, that's three, and yet one, unity. And the Bible says in 1 John 5, 7, these three are one. Talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, uh, people will say Trinity is not in the Bible, rapture, things like that. Well, we know these are not Bible words, but they signify Bible doctrine. And I think when we are teaching the Bible, we need to prove all things with the Scripture and be very clear and specific because there are people who may use these words and there's variation about what they believe. Um, and uh, that's why we need to be specific and clearly show from the Scripture what we believe and why. But, uh, you know, people say, well, the Catholics use the word Trinity, but they also talk about the virgin birth and the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We understand the Catholic Church is a false religion. We understand that they teach a false gospel, and they're replete with false doctrine and traditions of men. But just because they use a word doesn't mean that we can't use a word. And um, I often, when dealing with such people who are nitpicking me to death, I say, well, why do you keep talking about how these words are not in the Bible? Because the word Bible is not in the Bible. I mean, have you ever thought about that? I mean, so where does it end, you see? And so, yeah, I think we need to be very clear and we need to show from the scriptures what we believe and why we believe it. But uh, I think some people get carried away with, you know, making a mountain out of a molehill. Now, the Bible word is Godhead, and this is a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. Paul used the word Godhead, and he used it three times. That's interesting, uh, because he's talking about uh, the fact there's one God, but that he exists in three persons. Now, there are some who will nitpick that. They say, uh, you can't uh, show me a, a verse where all three are referred to as persons. You might show me a verse where the Father is called a person or the Son is called a person, but you can't show me one where the Holy Spirit... Well, look, we know what a person is, and uh, when you study the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in the Bible, it's clear they're persons, okay? So save that for someone else. Okay, I don't have time for that kind of thing. But you, there are, it's amazing how... And it just goes to show you the state of things in the professing church where professing Christians fight over and nitpick each other over a simple fundamental of the faith like the Trinity. Now, it's a, it's a very deep doctrine, very profound doctrine, but it's simply taught in the Bible. It's very clear. And so one God in three persons and co-equal, co-existent. Uh, you know, the Son and the Spirit are equally God with the Father. That's why all three of them are called God. The Father, obviously, in many passages is called God. The Father calls the Son God. In Hebrews 1.8, Thy throne, O God, the Father speaking to the Son, is forever and ever. Uh, the Holy Ghost is called God in Acts 5. And, uh, and when you study the attributes of God, you see how the attributes of God are applied in the Bible to all three. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So they're co-equal, co-existent God. The Godhead. One God, not three gods, one God and three persons. And someone says, how can that be? Well, it's a deep thing for sure, but it's not that difficult when you think in terms like this. I mean, uh, the Osteen family is one family unit, but there are five members in my household. My wife and I and our three children. It's not five families, it's one family and five persons. Uh, so, one God in three persons. That is implied in the Old Testament, very plainly revealed and declared in the New Testament. You go back to Genesis 1, the first uh, chapter of the Bible. When God made man, he said, let us make man in our image. Okay, three members. 
of the Godhead. In fact, you can go back before Adam, where before the world began, God promised uh, eternal life. Titus 1, in hope of eternal life, which God promised before the world began. God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Well, who did he promise it to? The Father and the Son and the Spirit. There was a council of the Godhead. Okay, so you come through, you got, come up to Tower of Babel. Uh, God says, let us go down and see. Uh, and uh, uh, you can write these references down and go check them up. For time's sake, I'm not going to turn to all these. I'm just giving you some examples. Uh, let's go all the way over to Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And Isaiah sees Jesus Christ in his kingdom glory in that vision. And holy, 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 not just for emphasis, but because holy is the Father, holy is the Son, and holy is the Spirit. In that passage, God commissions Isaiah. He says, who will go for us? Okay, plural, one God in three persons. You come in the New Testament, it's so crystal clear. First John 5, 7, there are three, three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And that verse is so clear that the devil had to try to get rid of it, and that's why the, the modern versions of the Bible omit the verse. And don't talk to me about manuscript evidence and how it doesn't belong. I know the manuscript evidence, and it does belong. Okay? And uh, so don't even try. If you're going to leave a comment and try to get me into it, I'm King James only. I believe the King James Bible is the pure word of God, inspired and preserved. I know why I believe that. I'm settled on that. Okay, I've heard all that stuff. 1 John 5, 7 belongs in the word of God. It is the word of God. That's not the only verse. Uh, on the Trinity. There are many verses, but um, I'm going to, um, well, let me, let me, there's so many things I'd like to do, but for time, I'm, I have to be brief with this, but back to the idea of three distinct persons, there are passages where you see all three together at one time, like at the baptism of Christ in Matthew 3, Jesus was being baptized, the Father speaks from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, the Spirit descends like a dove, uh, they are present at the same time. So it's not modes. Some people talk about how God goes into different modes, but it's one person, not three, and so on. No, three persons, okay? Co-equal, co-existent, um, co-eternal. Three persons in the Godhead. Um, you know, there's. I, I, I'm looking at a list I have right here. i got a number of passages like that where you see three at the same time, and that, but I think the one in Matthew 3 is so crystal clear, we'll just use that. Now, um, again, I'm not going to give, I have a whole list of attributes uh, of God and how, how, and there's verse after verse where you see them applied to all three, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and you can search that out and do your homework on that and see. But let me finish with um, Ephesians, because this is the divine, uh, this is the pinnacle divine revelation. This uh, uh, Ephesians is for this present age concerning the body of Christ, what Revelation is uh, for the prophetic kingdom program of Israel. The book of Revelation is like the capstone, like Ephesians is. And uh, it, there's, there's, it's interesting when you look at Ephesians and Revelation how uh, both are marked by sevens. And you, I'm sure you're well aware of all the sevens in the book of Revelation. But in Ephesians, it opens with seven spiritual blessings. It closes with seven pieces of spiritual armor. And in the midst of it, it has the sevenfold unity of the Spirit. And that's not the only sevens, but it's at the beginning, at the middle, and right in the midst. Uh, the beginning, the end, and right in the midst. So um, seven is God's number of perfection, completion. But both Ephesians and the book of Revelation emphasize the Godhead, the, the Trinity. Uh, in fact, if you check uh, the introduction, the greeting in the book of Revelation, you see it's from the Godhead. And you have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit mentioned there in the introduction, and it's emphasized in the book of Revelation. The book of Ephesians, uh, really, just all through it, emphasizes the Godhead. Uh, for an example, in chapter 2, verse 18, for through him, talking about Jesus Christ, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. There's the Godhead, and it's like that all through Ephesians. You see it in the uh, 
unity of the Spirit, uh, one Lord, one Spirit, one God and Father. Uh, that's Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6. And uh, I see it all through Ephesians, and I won't give you all of it. You can search it and see. That's some homework for you. But it starts off, this is so clear to me, you know, salvations of the Lord. It's his work. It's his salvation. We must choose to believe on Christ and be saved, trusting in his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, but yet, uh, you know, God gets all the glory. Okay, our trust in Christ is not a work. Paul said to him that worketh not but believeth, his faith is counted for righteousness. God gets all the glory for salvation. And when you come into Ephesians 1, uh, you, you, you see spiritual blessings from the Father, from the Son, and from the Holy Spirit. You have the will of the Father, the work of the Son, and the witness of the Spirit, for an example. And you come through here and you look at these wonderful blessings and salvation from the Father, Son, and Spirit, and every section ends with, with words to this effect, to the praise of His glory. The Father gets the glory, the Son gets the glory, the Spirit gets the glory. And so that is the Godhead. And you see the Trinity working in unity as the Godhead in creation. The Spirit moved, God spoke, and Christ created all things. You see that. You go back into Genesis 1. The incarnation, how the Father gave, the Spirit placed the seed, and the Son was born. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So the Father gave, the Spirit overshadowed there, placed the seed in Mary's womb, and the Son of God was born. Uh, in resurrection, the Bible says God raised him from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ. God raised him from the dead, but I can show you verses where the Father raised him where the Son raised himself, and where the Holy Ghost raised him. And uh, so in prayer, we pray to the Father, Ephesians 3.14, in the name of the Son, Ephesians 5.20, in the Spirit, Ephesians 6.18. But this thing about salvation, that's crystal clear to the praise of his glory. One God in three persons. Uh, that's the Godhead. And Christ is the fullness of the Godhead, bodily that proves the deity of christ many verses do but uh, i don't have a, a problem with trinity uh if we understand it in the biblical doctrine of the godhead and 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 what all the things we covered and there's much more we could cover but i think that's enough and our time is up and so uh, if you have any questions uh you can leave a comment or send me an email my uh, email address by which you can reach me is on our website uh, HopeBibleChurchGA.com and uh, would love to hear from you. Thank you for watching.